Hello, welcome to this YouTube channel. Today, I will discuss on the poetry of T.S. Eliot. As you can see, that the poetry of T.S. Eliot is in your CC T12 paper. Title of this particular paper is British Literature, the Early 20th Century. So fundamentally, before going to the poetry of T.S. Eliot, to be specific, I need to discuss something about T.S. Eliot. What are the basic patterns of writing that T.S. Eliot actually followed? What do we mean by the modern poetry? What are the basic theorization that we should follow in the modern period, that is in the modern poetry to be specific? And at the same time, you will find that what are the terminologies that T.S. Eliot invented, or rather he coined in his essays, that is the critical essays, and how so far these theories are important to describe and discuss the particular form of theory that Eliot imposed in his own poetry. Uh, as you can see that uh, T.S. Eliot is very important in the modern literature. You see that so far as the poetry is concerned, we need to know something about T.S. Eliot. So far as the modern theory of drama is concerned, we have to read some of the texts by T.S. Eliot like uh, the Mother in the Cathedral or Rock or uh, the other texts. And also, so far as the modern theories are concerned, we will find there are ample references of Eliot's writing. Say, for example, Tradition and Individual Talent, which is also in your syllabus in the DSC T3 paper. So, uh, before going to the particular form of poetry, you see that uh, you have three particular poems by T.S. Eliot. The first one is The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. The second one, The Preludes. And also, there is The Hollow Man. So, that's why uh, it is better to discuss on the introductory perspectives of Eliot's formation of poetry and some other representation. You see that in this particular slide, I have taken references regarding the overall concept of modern poetry. So far as the semester courses are concerned, you are facing a particular kind of difficulty regarding the history of English literature because it is not directly being mentioned in your syllabus. So that's why regarding the overall concept of modern poetry, you need to clarify some of the features of modern poetry, some of the basic orientations, what actually happened to modern poetry, what are the basic differences between the poets of 30s and poets of 50s and poets of the later period, and how so far each and every genre, that is literary genre, are different from the other genres of writing. So that's why I thought that uh, a bit of concept of modern poetry is needed uh, in this particular discussion. You see that whenever we will read modern poetry, to be specific, we find that somehow modern period, this particular period comes as a kind of antithetical representations of life and other things in, in the form of poetry or maybe literature. Uh, antithetical to the, the typical Romantic period. As we can see that the Victorian period is generally being considered as either a mere continuation of the Romantic age or maybe a particular kind of a revolt against the Romantic age or that is, you know, it's a kind of a transition towards the modern period. So that's why whenever we will deal with the modern poetry or modern period to be specific, then we will find that modern period came as antithetical to the Romantic period. So that's why the basic features of Romantic literature, the basic features of Romantic poetry to be specific that we can find in the theories of uh, William Wordsworth's a preface to lyrical ballads that is also present in your DACT3 paper and also Biographia Literaria that was written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and it is also in the DACT3 paper. So ultimately uh, the basic formations of theorization that these authors actually made and also you will find in the other texts say for example the letters by John Keats 
and also there is another one that is by uh, Shelley, B.B. Shelley, the, the, the basic form of theory that B.B. Shelley wrote on the poetry itself. So ultimately, if you try to gather the basic orientations of poetry that has to be clarified in terms of the Romantic period, you will find the basic patterns of writing, whether it is the subject matter of poetry, whether it is the, uh, the patterns of the poet, or maybe the, the pattern of writing, whether it is the poetic diction or the basic formation of language that actually the Romantic writers followed. Whenever you will deal with the modern poetry, you will find that these are starkly different. So that's why to read modern poetry with its utmost uh, importance, as you can know, that we have to follow the modern theories uh, that have been written by the authors of this particular period. And uh, one of the, the most important writer or most important theoretician who was also a, a, a poet uh, and he was T.S. Eliot, obviously. That's why you have tradition and individual talent in your syllabus. And also you can you can read the other texts like, you know, Hamlet and his problem and also the metaphysical poets, which are very important to refer to the basic theories of uh, criticism that have been related with the modern poetry, to be specific. Now, what happens, you know, that whenever we will deal with the modern poetry, we find in a nutshell that I have to say here, we find that the, the basic cultural theories like, you know, Marxism and at the same time feminism and post-colonialism, the power orientations, imperialisms to be specific, each and every kind of theories that have been implemented in literature as well as in the society, the socio-cultural theories or maybe the cultural theories that can be classified, you have to go through the theories and you can implement, you can use those theories to uh, interpret the texts that are considered to be the modern poetry, to be specific. And at the same time, you will find that whenever you will go with T.S. Eliot, you need to know something about the anthropological histories of England. And at the same time, Eliot, in Eliot's writing, you will find some classical references are also being there. That's why in the second point that you will find here, I have mentioned that Eliot is a classicist, obviously. So why Eliot is a bit tough to interpret, why Eliot's writings are a bit tough to interpret, that's why, uh, because you will find that in Eliot's uh, formation of writing, there are ample references of classicism, new criticism, and modernism to be specific, you see. That ultimately what I'm trying to suggest here that uh, uh, whenever you will deal with Eliot, you will find that he was out and out a classicist and the basic formations of classicism that can be found to be present in Eliot's writing. Say for example, I will come to that later when I will discuss on uh, Eliot's idea of tradition, what he says in his traditional individual talent regarding the concept of tradition and how tradition is important, the concept of historical sense and others that you will find in the traditional individual talent the essay. So uh, you will find that somehow Eliot is with a particular view that when you are dealing with tradition, when you are thinking in terms of, uh, you know, the, the ancient texts and how these are important in terms of the modern period or modern literature, then somehow you will find that the, the typical kind of classicist is present within Eliot because Eliot is always thinking in terms of the the typical balance and also the quality that was vested in the classical literature. And somehow, whenever we need to write something, it is not simply the uh, innovative mechanism that you should follow. Rather, you should concentrate on the classical formations of writing and you need to uh, focus the, the theories of classicism you know, the balance, the decorum, the particular kind of an order that have to be followed, all the basic features of the classical texts and how these have to be incorporated in the modern scenario. So fundamentally, you will find that Eliot has to be treated as a classicist. I again repeat that, that the constraint of time, it, is, it doesn't give me the uh, chance of speaking uh, these these points in a large uh, form, obviously. Okay, the canvas is small, so the picture has to be small too. 
So that's why what I'm trying to suggest you see that uh, whenever we will go with uh, the texts, that is, um, say for example, Hollow Man, okay, it is in your syllabus, and you will find that Eliot is continuously referring to Dante's Divine Comedy. Okay, because you will find that so far as the epigraph is concerned, and also at the same time, so far as uh, the, the references of Beatrice and Dante, his meeting, you know, the concept of Inferno and Purgatorio and Paradiso, everything you will find, or uh, you will find that these are being jumbled up in a single poetry. So that's why whenever you will go with the texts, maybe it is something, you know, you are reading in a, a typical modern scenario you will find that somehow Eliot is writing to represent the modern society. But at the same time, he is a classicist temperament or the temperament of a classicist is always in work in his fundamental forms of poetry. That's why the, of the order, that's why the balance, that's why the decorum, you know, the influence of Horace and influence of the, the classical uh, thinkers is also present within this particular form of poetry. Uh, Again, the second thing that I should say here that it is not simply the matter of classicism or the orientation of a classicist that has to be treated or found in Eliot's formation of writing. The second thing that we will find it is a, a new critic that is Eliot himself was a new critic. Do you know what is new criticism actually signify? Uh, Probably it will be better for you if you go through M. H. Abrams or any other book that actually says something about the literary terms okay and probably you will get the basic implications of new criticism and classicism and modernism in an art cell and if you can identify the basic features of these theories and these uh, you know ideologies then you will find that what i am trying to suggest here that in in Eliot's formation of writing whether it is a poetry whether it is a play you see, the, the poetic plays or maybe the poetic dramas that have been written by T.S. Eliot, like Murder in the Cathedral and Rock and others, uh, you will find that somehow Eliotian uh, concept of poetry, it can be classified in terms of new critical temperament. What I'm trying to suggest here, you see, that in, in his tradition and individual talent, as you can see, that Eliot is writing, Eliot is stating about the, the impersonal theory that I will discuss uh, in this particular point, as you can see here, the concept of depersonalization or impersonal theory. Now, what the uh, new critics actually say, what the new critics actually point, new critics say, in an article, I have to say here that uh, new critics actually say that whenever you will read any particular text, or maybe whether it is a poetry, whether it is a play, whether it is a novel, or in any other form, uh, you need to read the text on the basis of the text itself. That means don't try to find the author in his writing. Okay, uh, the the, the text itself is suggestive enough about the basic formation of ideology or the information or maybe the thought process of the poet that have been pointed out by him in the formation of the, the text itself. That means uh, just forget about the external impulses, forget about the external influences, forget about the poet to be specific. Okay, what you need is a kind of a close reading that the new critics actually thought or considered as explication the text. That actually means close reading of the texts. That means the meaning itself is remaining inherent within the text. And don't try to find for the poet, don't try to find for the, the external influences uh, to identify the meaning of the text because it is inherent within this text, text itself. So, as a new critic, you will find that Eliot is always thinking, Eliot is always propagating this particular ideology of impersonalization or depersonalization, impersonal theory. That actually in, in indicates or it says that, uh, you know, that whenever you are dealing with writing poetry, okay, fundamentally you needn't have to uh, express what you do actually feel okay so from that particular perspective you will find that the concept of persona actually generates or is being generated 
That means whenever we read any particular poetry, uh, we generally we, we try to identify that, uh, okay, this particular poem was written in the year 1937, try and it was written by any uh, Victorian author. So try to identify what is happening or what was happening to that man in that particular year 1937. Was he suffering from a particular kind of a crisis and, and that particular crisis gets reflected in the formation of poetry? Was he suffering from a kind of a breakup between himself and his beloved? And that's why the, the, the implications of separation or destruction is being oriented in this particular text. So the typical bioliterary criticism that you can find in the typical post-structuralist orientation today. Uh, so this bioliterary criticism was, according to T.S. Eliot, had to be negated while writing and also reading the text itself. So that's why it is a kind of an impersonal theory. I will come to that later and we'll discuss the, the theory itself. Uh, so, as a new critic, you will find that the words and phrases, the basic orientations, uh, these are significantly very important and you needn't have to bring all your, you see, the mindset, the typical formation of mindset and the external influences being uh, to be recognized in, in your writing. So, that particular orientation is also being found in Eliot's writing, obviously. It will be continued in the next lecture, obviously. So uh, the, the last one that I should say here and the rest will be continued in my next lecture. The last one is Eliot as a modernist. Okay. So that particular identity of T.S. Eliot is always in operation as we know. Because you know that the hardcore modernism and the basic theories of modernism always incorporate Eliot as a strong pillar of modernism. Always we know. Okay, because you will find that the, the basic orientations of modernism, say fragmentation, for example, you will find the same in Eliot's writing. Say the, the typical representation of the society as modernists or the modern theories are always orienting. Okay, the, the breaking, love for the purse to some extent, because uh, the, the, the purse was good, but now the, the modern society is being completely degenerated into a particular kind of a vacuity or vacuum. Okay, this particular kind of degeneration, this particular kind of spiritual vacuum, this particular kind of, you see, the decadence is always at the focus of the modernists. And you will find that Eliot in his writing, you know, out and out from his first poem to his last poem, you will find a continuous form of flux is being oriented. It's a kind of a continuous formation of journey. If you think of Eliot's uh, love song of J. Alfred Prufak, you will find there is obviously, uh, you know, temperamentally this particular poem is associated with the Victorian period rather than the modern period. But at the same time, you will find that in this particular poem too, there are ample references of, of you know, the bipolar disorder. That is the fundamental representation of the psyche or maybe the psychoanalysis in the later modern literature. And at the same time, you will find that there is a kind of a clash and conflict that is going on within a particular person. So let us go then you and I, the you and I, who are they? Are they two different persons or maybe these, uh, these are actually interpreting or indicating towards the psyche itself? One particular self is, you know, communicating with the other to be or not to be. That kind of crisis is always present within it. So fundamentally the patterns of modernism, it is not simply the fragmentation, it is not simply uh, the, the basic orientation of psychology or the presentation of the society, but also the other pa patterns of modernist temperaments, say cubism, say futurism, you see, okay, the expressionism or expressionistic orientations, all these things and also the other theories that can be associated or accumulated with modernism to be specific. All these have to be found in Eliot's writing fundamentally. So that's why uh, it, is, it is not very easy to go through the poems without these theories, without these, you know, different orientations of the text. If you go line by line and ultimately you do, do not know anything about the theories and how they have been incorporated in Eliot's writing, uh, it will be a partial reading obviously, an incomplete reading. 
So that's why you need to know what Eliot actually propounded. You need to know what Eliot actually thought. You need to know about uh, at least an outline about Eliot's theories and Eliot's ideas that he tried to incorporate in his poems. How they are working and how they are being uh, at uh, operation in his poetry, it will be discussed in while I will go with the, the texts, obviously, line by line. But apart from these three major segmentations, that is, Eliot as a classicist, or Eliot as a new critic, or Eliot as a modernist, there are other things too. So it will be continued in my next lecture. Stay attached. Thank you.